Hello, uh, in this video we will see about uh, Charles Darwin and his contribution to evolutionary biology. The so-called Darwinism, but it's not really ideology. As you know, in science there is no belief, but uh, popularly known as Darwinism, uh, what the philosophical framework of Charles Darwin, you see. So the Darwin, of course, uh, you know, he wrote The Origin of Species, describing his experiences with the voyage of Beagle, and all those things right i i hope you already knew all these the, the basics about it uh, you know so much of the darwin's inspiration for his theory of evolution uh, by the natural selection came from his voyage in the hms beagle in 1831 so this is the year in which he uh, you know embarked right embarking and disembarking so it's basically embarking is like when you start a long ocean voyage is called embark while when you return is known as disembark so he embarked in 1831 in this uh, ship. Uh, you might know the story behind it and uh, Fritz Roy, right? So he was the captain of the ship. And it was a survey ship, you know, and it was a circumnavigation. And uh, uh, before that, of course, he was influenced with countless number of natural historians, including Alexander von Humboldt of the German. And he uh, celebrated German explorer, went to South America, you know, most of the South American economy. He extensively wrote about it. So he was greatly influenced and that is the reason why he uh, went for this voyage. And uh, he saw incredible diversity of species, different kinds of species wherever he went in, isn't it? Uh, and also adaptation to a wide variety of environment. By the way, adaptation, remember, it was not... Uh, Darwin's alone contribution. It was already been described by, uh, you know, uh, Lamarck, right, French national historian. So, uh, Brazilian rainforest, he went in Chilean desert, and also, of course, before Chile, he went into Patagonia in uh, uh, Argentina. Then, uh, several of the oceanic islands, of which the most famous is Galapagos, right? And uh, the ship that he went in is uh, the HMS Beagle. Uh, you know, so that is uh, basically it's a, a British uh, vessel, and uh, he uh, he departed from Plymouth uh, in the west of England, uh, he, and he disembarked. Uh, he embarked on twenty seventh December in thirty one, and uh, the, the voyage lasted till second October of eighteen thirty six. So it's uh, you know you can see that almost more than five years. It, it lasted it's such a long voyage and it's just not the voyage but he took countless number of breaks uh, for describing uh, you know what he saw in in the the places and also it's not simply observing but he also collected the specimen and he frequently sent back to england you know of course through sea post isn't it sea mail so yeah the galapagos island was uh, particularly impressive for darwin if you read his uh, uh, original species much of it is about the galapagos island and uh, what he observed over there so the reason is very simple the island is highly isolated you know so you won't see the species in that island elsewhere in the world something like antarctica but of course he didn't go to antarctica so the galapagos is a very interesting place for him right and uh, of course it's all about the endemism right of course that the term was not yet known and there is a reason why a lot of endemic diverse species richness you can find in Galapagos Island. And uh, their closest living relative would be in the mainland, few hundred miles away in, in the Chile and Peru, you know. So then he spent next 27 years developing a theory to explain what he saw. And of course, the theory didn't come, uh, you know, uh, come from like a tabula rasa. The Latin term tabula rasa means blank slate. It's not that he simply coined the entire theory by himself. No, it was countless number of influences like demographer, uh, right? So Malthus, for example, and also uh, Humboldt. I mean, so many of the influences were there to influence the Darwin to coin out. But the theory of evolution by natural selection is very original. And he amassed a large number of evidences to substantiate his uh, theory you know so this is the route that he took from plymouth uh, through uh, you know this atlantic ocean to bahia in uh, brazil then rio de janeiro montevideo uh, and then you know these are the patagonia isn't it and falkland island is the closest place to the 
Antarctic, of course, he, he, he crossed the Drake Passage and then Chile and uh, Galapagos Island, you know, and Peru, of course. Calao Lima is in Peru, the capital of Peru is Lima, isn't it? So then he spent a lot of time in Galapagos and then he continued the journey uh, westward uh, to reach uh, Sydney and then Hobart, and then King George Island, Mauritius and Cape Town. And finally, he went back to Bahia and on his way back to Plymouth. So the journey started and ended in the Plymouth. You know, the Plymouth is a very nice place. I spent uh, some weeks in Plymouth. Uh, you know, that is where the Marine Biological Association's lab, UK's, the most famous marine labs are in Plymouth, right? And of course, Plymouth has a, a, a nice shipbuilding industry also in the UK. Most famous shipbuilders are in, either in Plymouth or in uh, Bristol in the Northern Ireland. And of course, uh, uh, if you read that original species, you will see a large number of st uh, stories about what Darwin is and also several, uh, you know, literature about the Darwin that uh, he didn't even, he, he was, a, a, you know, a living legend. He is, a, a, you know, the natural historian to the core. He's not simply observing the thing, but he also ate. That is what the latest uh, evidence suggests. And of course, if you read uh, his notebooks, he made a detailed account, including the taste of uh, the animals and plants that he came across, uh, for example, iguanas, you know, so in the Galapagos, the reptiles, uh, or armadillos, you know, or puma, he even ate puma, uh, and also, you know, the, the giant tortoises, there are actually accounts of the the girl, you know, uh, uh, I mean, the, the intestine, the gut, uh, the content of the gut of the tortoise, he squeezed and he drank, the, the juice of the giant tortoise is <laughs> very interesting. Please have a look at that, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the literature. And of course, he also had rodents, you know, and he, he described in his book that some of the rodents that he tasted, rats, you know, the most delicious among all meats <laughs> in, in this, uh, you know, in, during his voyage were rodents. And even birds like, you know, this big ostrich-like bird, the bird is known as a rhea. And even he had rhea meat. So it's very interesting, this guy, isn't it? And what did he actually observe? Well, there are mainly two observations which he made. First observation is that the overproduction. So that means that individuals of every species uh, have an ability to produce more offsprings than the environment can possibly support with food, space, and other resources. So overproduction, basically. So, you know, the, we all produce a lot. Of course, this uh, canonical diagram of a human, you know, it's basically human sperm and uh, trying to fertilize one ovum. So you can see that millions of sperms are uh, ejaculated, isn't it? And out of it, only one can fertilize the ovum. So what if, can you ever imagine each of these sperms can fertilize its own uh, ovum? So how many, uh, you know, uh, offsprings one individual can have? So, you know, there is, a, of course, there is a struggle and that struggle can happen at various levels. Here also, there is a struggle happens when uh, a fertilization happens. Only the most fittest uh, among millions of sperm can able to fertilize the ovum. So that itself is a selection, you see. And after fertilization, uh, when the baby is born, of course, only the fittest baby, if the baby has some disease like... Uh, uh, you know, the trisomy, you know, the chromosomal abnormalities, then the kid might not even reach, uh, you know, the reproductive age. So uh, the, the offspring simply perish, right? Only the fittest can reach the reproductive age to pass on their uh, genome to the next generation, right? So that selection always happens. So overproduction is really important. And that can happen at various levels. And of course, this overproduction, the idea is not just the Darwin. Darwin uh, have tremendous influence from the Malthus. Of course, he cited in his work. So Malthus is the guy, the demographer, remember? We spoke about the economist and he made a very interesting theory why the struggle for existence is really important for uh, uh, because of the overproduction. You know, resources are limited while individuals, you know, especially he wrote on human population, but Darwin observed this for the every organisms on planet Earth. You know, so resources are limited. So you need to have struggle for existence, right? Uh, that is inevitable. 
second observation which he made is very interesting that is uh, only darwin he made uh, this observation of course that observation uh, many people might have seen it we all see it right the observation like every every people that you come across are different isn't it human people not two individuals have same appearance yeah some myths say there are seven people just like you but you know there is no it's unsubstantiated myth so everybody is unique in appearance the human population we very well know and that's the same thing for uh, you know any kind of organisms on planet earth so there is something called variation uh, uh, everything is unique everybody is every individual is unique because the variation is mostly due to uh, the mutation which are random you see so there is no one can control over the mutation and of course nurture also plays a role the way that we grew up uh, you know that the factors uh, like environment you know and uh, the parental uh, influence everything matters right so yeah you cannot have even for among the twins you know uh, monozygotic twins there are various uh, variations though their genome is identical right so individuals in a population can vary many heritable traits so that is what his observation of the individual variation is and i think it's really important observation these two are the landmark observations of the darwin and then he first he wrote about the theory of descent with modification that is the most important you know so that is uh, this theory is what irked most of the religious stalwarts the reason is that he, he is saying uh, you know darwin of course he was a uh, you know atheist and that is the reason why people started criticizing Darwin a lot. So, of course, his theory, uh, you know, immediately challenged the, the view of Abrahamic religions, you know. So, common descent means the entire life originated from one individual, not one in the tree. So, you can see that the entire life on planet Earth is like a, a giant tree. The root is where the origin of life happened. The abiogenesis remember we covered this topic right abiogenesis happened approximately four billion years from today so it's only once in in the in the the, the life is, uh, history of the life on planet earth so after this then uh, you know uh, the population started emerging and speciation happens so this is something like uh, the the phylogenetic tree the earliest known depiction of the phylogenetic tree is this drawing and this drawing is uh, it's his own handwriting the darwin's handwriting in darwin's book i think illustration you know and i have seen this original in the uh, natural history museum in london they had special exhibit on darwin uh, in 2009 when i visited the first time so uh, what he wrote in here is that i think d and b are a lot more similar or b and c are a lot more similar than either with a because there are, there's a lot of uh, changes that might have happened from A to either B or C or D, you know, so that is what uh, he wrote. So descent with modification is how a new species is formed. So this is, you know, uh, vertical transmission, you see, but now we know that the horizontal gene transmission also happens. But in any case, though, by the way, vertical means from parents to offspring, the gene, what we get, like my genome, Half of it comes from my father, while half comes from my mother, isn't it? So that is the vertical transmission. While horizontal means when I get a cold, common cold, rhinovirus, for example, some of the viral uh, genome gets integrated into the human genome, you know? So retrovirus especially. So that kind of getting the genes from entirely different lineage, a different species is called horizontal gene transfer. The phenomenon is very common in bacteria, but also viral diseases you know because viruses have these transposable elements uh, jumping genes you know uh, especially retro transposons right so uh, yes yeah, so the descent with modification is a commonly accepted definition of evolution in darwin's uh, point of view so evolving the, the traits keep on changing because each time you have a baby you know offspring it's not copycat of the parent had it been cloning, then it's simple copy without any variation, right? Uh, but that kind of cloning or parthenogenesis is extremely rare in animals, isn't it? But for plants, yeah, it is uh, quite common. And especially for bacteria, asexual reproduction is very common. 
but for sexually reproducing organism descent is always with some modification and that is exactly what the evolution is so these two observations the overproduction and individual variation these are the, his primary uh, observations but uh, you know understand that the overproduction he got this idea from malthus uh, that uh, you know the the guy who wrote that famous essay on human population so by getting these two observation what he found is something called variational theory of evolution or adaptative evolution so it's all adaptation is happening here differential reproductive success so that is exactly what you call it as natural selection the, the idea of natural selection is not merely darwin because independently the valas also conceived the same idea valas was a uh, biogeographer you know and he worked uh, he spent almost an entire his time in indo malay archipelago uh, indo means indonesia not india no indo malay malay means malaysia right indonesia and malaysia archipelago the group of islands that is where he spent his time and yes yeah, so the idea is that uh, uh, you know the individuals have more babies can uh, uh, the babies can uh, possibly survive you see there's a, uh, only few can survive and because of that there is a lot of struggle to exist even you know so the individuals compete among each other for reaching the reproductive age for getting the resources and to find the mate you know so sexual selection you might know will come later uh, sexual selection is that natural selection that happening for uh, finding the mate you know so yes yeah, so overproduction make it inevitable that to exist you need to compete and who wins the competition because this individuals have a lot of variation and only certain variables are uh, selected for you know so the, the best fit variations what is this best fit those variation that increase the organisms uh, you know ability to survive and reproduce so only those organisms that is basically nothing but adaptation right so adaptative traits individuals with adaptive variations survive to reproduce to pass on their genes to the next generation that exactly is what you call it as natural selection you know so individuals with traits best suited to the local environment the prevailing niche and habitat you know so the local environment whatever is available in that environment uh, that is what adaptation is thrives so only those in individuals thrive so for example in some areas of galapagos islands as he uh, wrote in his book uh, you know you will see the fleshy uh, fruits a lot so in those locations it is the finch finch is nothing but a bird you know so the finch with long slender uh, beak so that kind of variation of the finch can easily survive because they can simply probe their long beak into the flesh of the fruits you know at the same time some other locations of the uh, galapagos you can see instead of this kind of fruits you can see uh, nuts you know so the nuts like um, a coconut so not you need to crack open so having this variation with a long slender beak is not a good adaptation you need to have stout you know very uh, you know stout in the sense is very small but very thick a uh, beak you need to have to crack open the nut so that variation is specifically advantageous uh, in that prevailing uh, you know environment you see so that is why these are called adaptation so adaptive traits right so again uh, i would like to emphasize adaptation itself is not the darwin's idea so he he synthesized the entire big picture by combining ideas from various sides so adaptation is from lamarck you see so that synthetic spirit of darwin is uh, what i like most you know so then he wrote the, the original species by means of natural selection and it has an alternative title or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life so here in this sense race in the sense uh, the spot or mutation or variation that is what he he meant to say so favored race means you know so those mutation which are advantageous for its survival that is adaptation you know for the struggle for life so very interesting title isn't it so yeah and uh, darwin uh, this is yet another book that darwin wrote the descent of man and selection in relation with the sex 
in relation to sex. So again, both of these are in the uh, uh, you know public domain. You can download from the course website too. These are free books. Though these are free, I suggest you to own a copy of at least this original spirit. It's very inexpensive, around 300 rupees. You can buy it, you know. So it's a very nice read. So the summary of his evolutionary theory, as summarized by Mayer, you know, the famous German biologist in 18, uh, 1982, he summarized it with five points. So first is evolution, that is a common descent. Characteristics of the lineages of the organisms change over time. So, uh, you know, the individuals keep on changing over time. The population, uh, you know, 100,000 years back and population today are quite different. Even Homo, you know, our own species, Homo sapiens. <clears throat> so that is what the evolution. So usually evolution doesn't happen instantaneously. And I already explained to you that evolution, one of the major factor determining the speed of evolution is, uh, you know, the doubling time. You know, so how long will it take? To pass on your genes to the next generation for human beings is approximately what uh, 15 years isn't it uh, 18 years the age till you reach the reproductive maturity at the same time for bacteria it is 10 minutes isn't it e coli for example generation time is very very less and for viruses is much lesser you know though viruses cannot divide by its own you need to have, find a host right so then second one is common descent that enter life could be portrayed as a single great family tree something like genealogical tree you can also draw a tree of your family you know you with your siblings then your parents then great parents then the great great parents from both sides you know that that kind of tree like illustration is called genealogical tree so yes it's not merely uh, our family tree but if you expand this tree to a great length you can include all animals and plants and microbes in it. So that exactly is called Tree of Life. By the way, there is a website called TOL, Tree of Life, in which you can click to expand the notes. It starts with, uh, you know, the last universal common ancestor, Luca, you know, the, the first uh, organism that is a uh, eubacteria, isn't it? Existed uh, after the abiogenesis uh, that might have happened approximately 4 billion years back. Until now, what are the various lineages of this giant tree of life? You can expand it, a TOL. Okay, so I link up in the show notes of this video. Please check it out. So the third important characteristic is gradualism. Gradualism, or uh, also known as phyletic gradualism, means it's very slow change, incremental change, nothing faster. You know, so yeah, because the mutations accumulate a very slow and kind of predictable. Remember molecular clock hypothesis which I introduced earlier. So that is how it's a gradual process. You know, so it's an incremental evolution of the differences. Uh, at the same time, uh, the Gold, Stephen Jay Gold and um, uh, Levantin, their theory of, uh, you know, uh, punctuated equilibria, it's a saltation. You know, saltation means sudden change in a uh, short time with uh, you know stasis for a long time so that model is highly non-linear so darwinism is linear model while punctuated equilibrium model which is yet another theory explaining the evolution you see especially on paleontology but the, both of them are Howard paleontologists right so if you look in the paleontology then that theory is a lot more favored right while Darwin was a biologist so if you look at the living organisms and living uh, diversity, then Darwinism is favored, which is linear, gradual. At the same time, paleontology, if you look, it's non-linear. And uh, there are actually sudden states of, uh, you know, a very fast evolution. The so-called revolutions, not simple evolution, right? And that actually happens during the time of calamities, like asteroid impact. For example, Chihuahua is a place in Mexico where a KT mass extinction event happened, right? Cretaceous tertiary. So, yeah, so that in Yucatan Peninsula, right? So that is uh, uh, that is now believed to be the reason for the, the, you know, the extinction of dinosaurs, right? So during the times of mass extinction events or during the time of calamities, populations shrink to very less individuals. 
uh, this phenomenon is known as bot population bottleneck, like the neck of the bottle, you know. So during those time, what will happen is that usually uh, which individual survive, you know. So which, uh, you know, which genotype survive depends mostly on random process. It's a mathematics you know, probability. Uh, nothing to do with how good you are, uh, how fit you are. You know, are you getting, there is no adaptation happening that time. It's mostly just a random chance. You know, uh, you can also think like, uh, for example, there is a, you know, you're flying in an airplane and then the flight crashes in, in, the, in the ocean, you know, uh, just above the ocean and it fell onto the sea. And suddenly, uh, you know, at the end, only two people survive. Suppose everybody knows swimming and only two people survive. Can you ever imagine who, who these two people would be? Are they the fittest one? Not, might not be, you know. So it is completely random, you see. So that is what is happening. That There is something called random process of drift. You know, the genetic drift is really prevalent during the times of calamity. So that is exactly what the punctuated equilibria is. But Darwinism is not like that. Darwinism is mostly gradual process, very slow process. And the, the change happens at the population level. That's the most important uh, point for the evolution to happen. Uh, it's not individuals uh, having some change. Like during my lifetime, whatever the change that I get it, like uh, my, some of my skin, uh, definitely there would be uh, interesting mutations in response to extreme UV light because I was in Antarctica for around six months. So Antarctica has this UV hall, isn't it? Ozone hall. So yeah, if you look at my skin cell, there might be some unique uh, mutations uh, which is not there in your skin cell so does it mean that this kind of mutation will uh, lead to the evolution no because it evolution happens when i pass on my genes to the next generation so in darwinian strict sense you know the the the, the purpose of human life is to mate and have an offspring and if you don't have an offspring then the life or death, there is no uh, difference in meaning. You know? But of course, uh, uh, beware of something called grandmother hypothesis. We will we will see all these things later on. Right? Uh, but yeah, so in strict sense of Darwinism, unless you pass on your genes to the next generation, then there is no point of even existence. You know, so populational change is what it drives the evolution. So proportion of the individuals within the population that have inherited the characteristics. So that exactly is what in population genetics, uh, you know, they call as frequency, frequency of the genotype or allele. So change of this allele frequencies in the population over time and over generation is what you call it as evolution, right? And finally, the fifth point is natural selection, which is independently considered by the Wallace, Alfred Russell Wallace. Evolution is caused by the differences in the individual's ability to survive, to reproduce, or survive and reproduce. So there is a directionality in the natural cell. It's not like completely random. Everybody has equal chance of surviving and reproducing. No. Only those individuals which are well fit to their environment and those who have a competitive advantage over other members of the same species in the same population, will survive to reproduce, isn't it? So it's not completely random. Who survive to pass on their uh, genes to the next generation? Is it completely random like genetic drift? No. Only those individuals that are well fit can pass on their genes to the next generation. Right? So there is a directionality of the natural selection too. So these are the, the summary of the Darwin's theory of evolution as per uh, Ernest Mayer, right? uh, the German biologist. And uh, yes, yet another way of saying this or summarizing the theory of evolution by picking up the five hallmarks of the, the, the theory of evolution. And what if you compare that with the special creation or intelligent design? Yeah, remember, this is basically the myth. The myth of intelligent de uh, design is what is portrayed in Bible, the first uh, testament of the Bible. So species change over time. That is what the Darwin said. That is basically microevolution, isn't it? This, uh, over time, even the same species like Homo sapiens, we are changing, isn't it? COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-2 is also changing 
on its lifetime. So that is what the microevolution is. That is something happening uh, inside the species or intraspecific or infraspecific evolution. At the same time, for uh, uh, special creation, species are static. These are not dynamic. You know, so one species never springs from the seeds of another species. That is what John Ray said. He was a, a famous botanist. John Ray is the first person who started naming uh, the plant species, though he predates uh, Carl Linnaeus. So it was not a binomial nomenclature, but it was a long name, you know. So John Ray famously said that one species never springs from the seeds of another. In one sense, yeah, you know, if you look at any seeds of a plant, if you plant it, can the seeds turned out to be a, a new species? No, it, it will never, right? So that idea that the species are always static is what is written in the, the in, in the Bible as well as that is what special theory. But, you know, it is not like instantaneous. It takes time for one population to diverge into two. You remember the speciation, there are multiple modes of speciation, especially four major modes, of which the, the most common mode is allopatric speciation, speciation because of the geographical barrier or vicariance. Uh, for example, a mountain. You know? So if there is no uh, populational genetic exchange happens, then uh, you know the population at either side of this geographic barrier turns out to be new species. right? And ne next uh, hallmark is lineage. Lineage is nothing but population evolving population so lineage is line in a phylogenetic tree so lineage split and diverge causing speciation so the split of this lineage uh, into two is exactly what you call as divergent evolution the the, the de facto evolution is divergent right one species like for example humans and chimps were just one species then uh, chimps started into a uh, uh, pang Pan is, it's, uh, you know, the, the genus, Pan, P-A-N. Well, human started into, uh, you know, Homo, our, uh, you know, how, our genus. So this uh, divergence that is called split of the, the lineage. So that is what you call the speciation, especially the allopatric speciation, right? But in the case of special creation, it's fixed species. Species are static. It doesn't change no divergence happen so new life forms derive from older forms that is called macroevolution so if you look in the you know the fossil history especially macroevolution rely much on uh, you know paleontology the fossil history so if you look in the uh, the fossil history the gradation is really really common so the same old uh, forms of the species turns out to be the, the new one you know so it's not the species is changing but uh, the ancestry is keep on changing, isn't it? So because of this variation, isn't it? So that is exactly the new life forms can derive from the older forms, morphological forms, as well as genetic diversity. At the same time, uh, in the case of special creation, each species is separately created. The same thing called scala naturae of Aristotle, and uh, you know the. Uh, the French historian Lamarck, right? So according to him, it is multiple scala naturae. So the problem is with Oxham's razor, so, or Occam's razor, the William of Occam, remember 16th century uh, philosopher, the British philosopher. Uh, this is a thumb, thumb rule in philosophy. So any kind of problem, be it in your life too. If, uh, you know, if there are multiple, uh, you know, the uh, way to describe the same problem or solutions are there, you should go with the simplest solution, with least assumptions. That is what the Occam's razor is. So he, the problem with uh, the, the special creation is that there are approximately 10 million eukaryotic species alone. So each of these species is separately created by a conscious entity. How much energy that uh, the, the entity needs, right? That is an extremely complicated definition. At the same time, uh, this descent with modification is a simple definition, yet elegant solution. So if you apply this thumb rule in the philosophy called Occam's razor, then you should choose Darwin's theory 
uh, of course that is not it's just additional uh, evidence you see so we have a, a plenty of scientific evidence too that uh, this particular theory is fallacious right <clears throat> and uh, yes yeah, so all life forms are related because of the common ancestry human beings are related with the chimpanzee gorilla yes we are also related with bacteria isn't it plants everything because there is the relationship is portrayed in a uh, giant tree of life but in this special creation, each species is independently created. So we are not at all related with other species. So that is a fallacious. And most importantly, that is what has irked a lot of religious stalwart, that the descent with modification this Darwin's theory is, uh, according to that theory, earth and life are immensely old, billions of years old. While according to special creation, earth and entire life on earth is very young you know only 6000 years <clears throat> but uh, you see that 6000 we have a, a large number of evidences to uh, you know to disprove this particular young theory hypothesis so and that is one reason why there is not much of the opposition to the theory of evolution from countries with substantial pagan population like shintoism in japan or here in india you know the hindu hinduism right uh, in veda i told you uh, earth is immensely old more than 1 billion years old 1.7 billion right so that is why uh, that concept is perfectly in sync with the darwin's concept you know that earth and life are immensely old but according to this one it's very young so it's only 6000 years old and that is the reason if you look in um, holy books religious holy book you will never see uh, you know, uh, dinosaurs, for example, or any kind of fossils or old uh, organisms, you know, only the latest one you can see, right, 6,000 years and uh, from then. So, yeah, these are the five hallmarks of it. So, the Darwin and Wallace, the Wallace is very interesting, Alfred Russell Wallace, he was a 19th century naturalist, uh, natural philosopher, and he was also just like Darwin, an explorer, you know, like Humboldt and worked extensively on biogeography. So he is considered as father of that discipline. By the way, biogeography is how the species are distributed in a geographical area and how this, uh, you know, various, uh, I mean, comparative analysis of the species characteristics, you know. So that is what you call it as biogeography. So usually biogeography is mostly to do with the morphological attributes of the species. And if you look at the genetic history, uh, that is the, the DNA sequence or protein sequence, then uh, you call it as a phylogeography, which is a subset of biogeography, right? And uh, he worked mostly at Malay archipelago, especially Indo-Malay archipelago, and where he had got a, a line on his name called Wallace line. That is what is separating the uh, Papua New Guinea as, uh, and uh, Australia with the uh, uh, the the left side that is west side is usually indomalai archipelago you know and also he uh, worked extensively in amazonian delta in brazil and then he developed essentially the same theory of evolution by the natural selection as darwin so it's completely independently he developed that theory very interesting right maybe uh wallace was also influenced by similar kind of essayist in england you know for example the malthus he might also have read about the Malthus work. To, he, they were contemporary. And then he, he came to know that the Darwin is also developing the same kind of theory. Then he wrote to the Darwin that I also have the same idea. And then the Darwin invited Wallace that to share, let us share the credits. See, that is a, a very interesting thing about the diplomacy, right? The interpersonal scientific diplomacy of the 19th century. Uh, that kind of diplomacy is getting rare in this 21st century, right? People keep on competing, or even colleagues in the same department keep on competing to, to eat the credit, isn't it? Or not to share the credit, or, you know, all these intellectual uh, property, right? Intellectual property rights, we are all well aware of it. But look at that, what they did in 19th century. We have to learn a lot from Darwin and Wallace, isn't it? So Darwin is much better known today because the theory of evolution or natural selection we usually attribute to the Darwin, not to Wallace. The reason is simple. Darwin has a large number of evidence, proof to substantiate his theory. While Wallace was more or less a theoretical biologist, 
so he did a conceptualization of that natural natural selection but he didn't have a lot large number of uh, you know uh, evidences to substantiate it so Wallace's arguments were more intuitive and contain less extensive battery of the examples so this is if you look at here this is australia and uh, new guinea right uh, well this this is basically uh, a french map and this is philippines and around this area is what you call it as Darwin, uh, I mean, Wallace line. And this one is equator, you know, so equator. It's a, it's a tropical place, you see. It's a, And this is the epicenter of marine species diversity. Very interesting. This area is the world's richest marine species you can see in this area. And whichever direction you go from this area, then the marine species diversity keep on decreasing. So very interesting, right? So maybe... This is the location of our uh, abiogenesis. Who knows, right? Uh, Four billion years back when the life originated. Uh, now people think that it is basically from, uh, you know, it is a, it's it's now a, a hot thermal offspring, you know, underneath the uh, ocean, right? So hot spring in uh, I mean uh, it's like a black smoker. So maybe this is a location where the life formed, and that is the reason why uh, this location have got huge marine diversity. And yes, yeah, so this area on the left side, you can see that is basically the west side. You can see Sumatra and Java, the two famous islands of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Indonesia. And uh, on the top of Sumatra, this this area north or northwest is what you call it as Malaysia, right? And Borneo is another uh, island. Also, this line, this is where usually he did his, a lot of work, the Wallace. You know? And by the way, natural selection, though uh, the natural selection is frequently attributed Darwin and Wallace but it predates W.C. Wells in 1813 he did a, a, a good analysis in England disease resistance in various countries and speculated the same phenomenon the natural selection though he didn't use the term natural selection but the idea of the natural selection earliest known idea is by W.C. Wells and later also Patrick Matthew he was a plant breeder the tree breeder uh, he was farming lumber uh, for the ship ship building lumber is nothing but timber you know and or uh, even uh, the beagle lechmas beagle was a wooden schooner isn't it so you need a lot of uh, uh, a nice wooden plank for it so while farming the trees he also observed a similar phenomenon so maybe artificial selection rather not really natural selection but uh, the phenomenon is more or less analogous to the natural selection so again the idea is not really novel so that is the reason that we keep on working on the old, older idea and we keep on refining this older idea. So that is how that uh, science progresses, isn't it? So if you look at in, in action, uh, this kind of uh, natural selection, you can see that uh, in a famous ex uh, example of Kittlewell's moth. So it's a species of moth. So before the industrial revolution of, uh, you know, the, the England, right? Great Britain is later, right? So earlier it was England. So in England, if you look in the before uh, 17th century, if you look at that picture, you can see that or uh, early 18th century. So you can see a lot of lichens. So lichens, by the way, the tree lichens are indicator species, isn't it? So if it's highly polluted, then lichens die away. So lichens, you can see that like in pristine habitats of uh, uh, rainforest or in Himalayas, you can see these kind of lichens. So earlier days, uh, in England also have this kind of tree lichens which are mostly peppered or kind of grayish, right, or white, whitish. Uh, and, you know, during those time, uh, you know, the, the moth with variation like peppered variation are well suited because of camouflage. Can you spot there is a, there is a moth here? We can see that this is an obvious moth because this moth is... Uh, you know black color so black uh, with the white background is easily discernible at the same time there is there is a very interesting moth here clover moth with this pepper peppered moth you know so it has got competitive advantage so during those days peppered moth is most common uh, frequency of this i mean the the commonest uh, you know the gene right allele was the peppered the frequency of peppered moth in the population was very high comparing with the black one 
And as the years goes by, what happened is that a core based a plant, power plant and other plants, uh, right? The, the factories uh, started proliferating in all over England. So these factories started emitting a lot of soot. Soot is nothing but a carbon, you know, like fly ash, right? It's black color particles into the air and it started depositing everywhere. So, you know, the tree bark started losing the lichen and on the other hand, it becomes deposited with the carbon particle. There is nothing but, you know, like coral, it's black in color. So when this happened, then the peppered moth, earlier it, it was advantageous mutation, but now it lost the advantage. Right? So at that time, during the industrial revolution, you can see that black moth population uh, started increasing. The frequency of black moth started increasing. So see the frequency of allele keep on changing. Earlier it was peppered moth frequency was high. Then during the industrial revolution, peppered moth frequency became lower while black moth became high. And now you see again it reverses because England has uh, some of the best air in the world, right? Uh, because they they are not no longer depends on the core based factories, right? And because of the uh, better environmental awareness, pollution levels have substantially reduced in England. Uh, that led to, uh, you know, this kind of soot is no longer a problem. And now you can see that older peppered moth is now increasing uh, in its frequency, while uh, this kind of black uh, moth is losing its competitive advantage because it can easily be spotted with the tree bark in the background. So this is exactly what you call it as evolution. Yet another way to define the evolution is change in allele frequency of a population over time, over generations, you know. So another concept in evolution is uh, something called co-evolution or also, you know, so exchange of favors, you see. So like uh, if you look at here, this is a flower, right? So uh, flower has, of course, a flower need pollinators to do the task, right? They, because it depends on insect pollinators to pollinate for the pollination. And without pollination, of course, the plants, the sexually reproducing plants cannot survive, right? So how do they manage these pollinators? So pollinators, of course, you have to bribe them, you know, honey, alluring bribe of uh, nectar, isn't it? For the honeybee, um, yeah, the honeybees are uh, the most important pollinators of the world. But of course, not merely honeybee, even uh, birds, right? Especially like, uh, you know, the, the red colored or, uh, you know, this kind of blue, blue colored flowers are usually pollinated by birds. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, so you need to pay the bribe to the, the uh, you know, the, the, the uh, pollinators, isn't it? But you need a balance. So that is what the economics play a major role in ec ecology as well as in evolution. So how much nectar can, uh, you know, the flower pay? The quid pro quo is a Spanish term that means exchange of goods or services. So if you bribe this honeybee a lot of nectar, then what will happen is that they are very satisfactory and they will not visit the other flower, right? And if you give very less nectar then they are no more longer interested in this species of plants and they will not come back again so you need a fine balance not too much not too little you just need the right one like uh, like the bear you know the three bears story that we have learned in our school days right nursery days so just like that um, uh, you know the, the the bears you know the, the just the right one right uh, right level of temperature in the soup for example so you need a fine balance not too much of nectar not too little bit of the nectar you just need a fine balance so that is uh, what you can see that in orchids as well so you know by the way i mean this is a new report you know so the, this is basically the orchid uh, the the hoverfly exists the blossom of this particular orchid that is uh, copripedium wadii so this orchid make something called fake pollen Instead of nectar, uh, they, they depend on these bees, uh, you know, and the bees are getting the, the, the pseudopollen. They eat this pseudopollen. What is the problem with the normal pollen? The reason is simple. If uh, the normal pollen is edible, pollens are never edible, you know. 
so if it's edible then what the bees will do is they will eat it you know so they digest it so the pollination never happens so that is the reason why orchids like this are making a uh, fake pollen which are uh, as nutritious as the real one that is what the latest uh, finding this is in the science mag the, the science uh, website in may article in 2021 i linked up in the show notes of this video have a look so it's it's very interesting you know so the quid pro quo so all these are really something to do with economics you know you need a fine balance of uh, uh, the like just like goldilocks you know the, the bear the three bears is called goldilocks problem right you just need the fine balance not too much not too little just right you know so that is exactly uh, i mean uh, yet another phenomenon is called coevolution coevolution is mirror evolution you know so host and uh, the pollinators or host and parasites are evolving concurrently so coevolution is the influence of closely associated species on each other in their evolution like human and uh, head louse you know the lice you know if you look at that lice uh, if you construct a tree of the human lice and human uh, populational in intraspecific variation then these trees are quite similar you know and host plant pollinators as in the case of the orchids and the bee for example or or, or the you know the, in this case the, the human head louse is basically host and parasite right uh, again that can co-evolve each other so it results in so-called mirror trees one of the famous example is in the fig or the ficus right ficus genus the figs and the fig wasps like this the wasp of the the fig so you know so different wasp have uh, wasp species have evolved concurrent with the different fig species the host as a host evolved so as uh, you know the the uh, the, the, the uh, wasp species the pollinators they are also evolve in it so this is what the, the tree if you look at the tree of the ficus sections and this is the tree of the pollinator the different kind of wasp you can see that you know these have host specificity for example tetrapus uh, is the pollinator for only this species you see nothing else and you can see that these two trees are quite similar in appearance because of this coevolution you know and coevolution uh, also determines the co you know there might be some intra specific competition also uh, the so called uh, arms race for example if i ask you to name the fastest land animals think about it fastest land animal of course the fastest would be a uh, falcon and other birds uh, birds are also land animals right but excluding the birds uh, the land uh, especially mammals fish exclude that right if you say the mammal land mammal the large mammals uh, you know the the fastest of course the fastest is cheetah which which can run at the speed of 120 kilometers per hour and all the fast uh, uh, fastest animals are either predators like cheetah lion greyhound coyote tiger or prey you know the these predators attack this prey you know pronghorn springbok wild beast black buck gazelle hare very interesting isn't it so these preys are getting more and more uh, faster you know they can run much faster uh, the reason is that the fastest one is being selected uh, by natural selection of course because only the fastest one can escape the these extremely fast running predators now as uh, you know the fastest one is getting selected within each species so as its predators isn't it the fastest running predators have got better chance if you are a cheetah for example if you run less uh, faster then chances are high that you might not get uh, you know you cannot hunt very nicely if you need to get food you have to run faster you know so for that uh, only the fastest ones are i mean the fastest ones are getting selected by the natural selection natural selection favors the fastest in both predators and prey but there are limits you know so that is exactly what you call it as co-evolutionary arms race by the way lion by the you know lion can run much faster than tiger uh, yes because the lion are much smaller than tiger do you know that 
I also learned only recently. I heard, I thought like, well, in childhood days, you know, if you look at the lion, it's like the king of forest, big, right? Very big face and all over, uh, looks like very uh, a large animal, but mostly this is uh, a myth, you know? So lion is much smaller than tiger, like a big uh, Bengal tiger, for example, is so much massive. I cannot run as fast as lion because lion is so much smaller in size. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that is called co-evolutionary arms race. So co-evolutionary arms race is also known as material compensation, give and take, right? Uh, yeah, so the, just like in the case of uh, pollinators and, uh, you know, and the host plant, the, the flower and uh, the honeybee, for example. Again, so evolution selects the fastest running predators like cheetah and the preys, fastest running preys like deer. However, there is a limit dictated by the laws of economy, you know. So speed and lean, you know, the uh, economy of speed is that you need to have very lean and long limbs. But if you have that very lean, extremely lean and long limbs, chances of having a fractured limb is also very high, you know. So that is the reason like Olympic sprinters, uh, uh, mostly these are African, right, the Kenyan, for example. Sprinters are really lean and thin, you know, athletic uh, shape. But if it's really lean, then the chances of fracture is also very high. So you need a, a fine balance, you know. So, yeah, so again, uh, another example would be like calcium, right? So if you have a, a lot of calcium, you need to have an adequate calcium for the bones. If you have a lot of calcium, more than what is required, then... Uh, what will happen is that you will have calcium stones and if you have less than adequate amount of calcium what will happen you're going to have easily fractured bone so you just need the fine balance like goldilocks conundrum you know so that is what uh, is dictated by the, the the principles of economy or the you look at the forest canopy so the trees in the in the forest of course the trees compete among the species or within the species uh, to reach the, the, the height, the maximum height, because you have a competitive advantage, right? If you are the tallest in the tree canopy, uh, forest canopy, then, you know, you get maximum sunlight, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so increasing the height of trees to outcompete its snipers for maximum height, uh, uh, the light harvest, is within the limit set by the economy of the higher photosynthetic if the if if the tree is really tall then photosynthetic rate is very high but you need to invest a lot on the vasculature that is basically the, the xylem and phloem you know so you need to spend a lot of resources to uh, to pump indeed right the the uh, you know the nutrients and uh, water up to that light uh, that height so yes the economy place at the intersection of all these things and yes so that is the summary of the darwin and his contribution so evolutionary arms race is also uh, first described by the darwin so very interesting concept isn't it